I love watching the House of Commons, especially on Wednesdays when they meet for Prime Minister's questions. This debate allows practically any question from any member, including backbenchers, directly to the Prime Minister. It's something which on occasion I've wished that the U.S. had, especially when the President comes up with a sweeping new policy proposal. It tends to bring everything out in public and lay the most important issues involved right on the table. As the UK staggers drunkenly towards Brexit though, I found myself scratching my head more and more. After dozens of votes to indicate where the majority opinion lies regarding Brexit, hint, there really isn't one, and multiple attempts to agree to a deal for Brexit which have all failed, the 3rd of April saw Commons finally agree to something. They have just made no deal Brexit illegal, requiring the government to request yet another extension from the EU if a deal cannot be agreed and signed. Oh boy, I may be an American, but given the global impact of Brexit on the economy, it's definitely time for some roasted opinions. As of right now, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland will leave the EU on the 12th of April. That means that barring a last minute reprieve from both the EU and the UK Parliament, in six days the UK will be out of the EU without a deal. Now one would think that this would be a matter of urgent priority with both the government and the opposition in the House of Commons. Their actions, which I've watched with keen interest, seem to indicate the opposite. There is no sense of urgency, just a growing panic in the House as we reach less than a week until the current deadline. Without a deal in place, Theresa May has requested yet another extension from the EU Executive Council. The biggest problem, and this has been noted publicly by members of Parliament, is that the EU is under no obligation to grant this extension. Without either a deal or an extension, I'm beginning to wonder if Parliament has merely made the inevitable illegal. If that is the case, then how does the UK Parliament go on to govern the country in its current configuration? Were I in Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's shoes, I would wonder strongly about proroguing Parliament on the 13th of April and requiring new elections. Naturally, I don't believe that the Queen will do anything of the sort without the request of the government. She has always been scrupulous about obeying both the letter and the spirit of the UK Constitution, unwritten though it may be, and both precedent and customary use for some time has been that the Crown does not interfere in matters of government and politics. I would think, though, that she entertains private irritation at the misguided mess that began when David Cameron rashly called for a Brexit referendum which didn't go quite as he expected. So what happens if the EU doesn't cooperate with Theresa May's plan? First, on April 12th, the contingency planning which the UK government has put in place for a no-deal Brexit kicks in, and we find out if May and her ministers have managed this possibility properly. Frankly, given the state of things in the UK, I have serious doubts about the effectiveness of this planning. In a day, the UK-EU trade relationship will transition from open borders to World Trade Organization rules. In all honesty though, I'm not convinced that the EU believes that no deal Brexit will happen either. Their attitudes have indicated that they will take a hardline stance on trade borders, which is a problem because as I've pointed out in previous videos about Brexit, the EU needs full access to Britain's markets more than Britain needs to access to the EU. Few in the Houses of Parliament seem to understand that, and even fewer seem to understand that the principal solution for the UK is to trade with other partners. The media in the UK, meanwhile, is in full spin mode, proclaiming dire possibilities. Basic necessities like medicines and foodstuffs come from the EU, and that is a significant hurdle to surmount. Gee, if there was only somewhere that could supply those commodities to the UK if media predictions of a hard border come to pass. A country which produces huge amounts of food and medicines and would be happy to sell more of them. Seriously though, the additional border checks won't change two basic facts about these commodities being shipped to the UK. The UK will still want to buy them and the EU will still want to sell them. 
Border chaos in trade will directly affect both partners in this scenario. But the producers in the EU cannot afford to lose the UK markets any more than the UK can afford to lose the commodities. What's more, the UK can easily decide that they will transition into WTO regulations on imported goods, unilaterally. The only way that I can see the dire predictions about trade barriers coming true is if the UK fully implements them in a day, which to me really wouldn't make sense. What? You mean to tell me that the UK would actually turn away shipments which were cleared for entry under the EU rules before the Brexit happened, forcing shipping companies to restart all of their paperwork under the new WTO rules? Why would they absolutely have to do that? Couldn't the UK state that all new shipments after a certain date will have to have WTO-based import documentation in order to provide a seamless transition from EU membership to independent trade partner? Does that day have to be the same day as Brexit? Um, no. Just, no. The answer is that they could probably do this, and should seriously consider it. May's government should have spent the last two years negotiating contingent trade deals with partners like China and the United States in order to open up markets outside of the EU. Have they done this? It seems that we may be about to find out. The US and China are tough negotiators on trade, but they are aware that new markets mean more GDP growth for their economies as well. And with the ongoing trade negotiations between the US and China, their growth rates have been slowed. Either will welcome new market access to the UK, and the UK could easily find something that people in the US and China would buy. Perhaps the UK could make a move reminiscent of her mercantile past and build up her shipping trade again. It's an island nation. Shipbuilding and transportation of goods is in their blood. The UK has some significant leverage in their economic exclusion zones too. The EU has had access to those waters and their resources, fisheries, mineral reserves, etc. Under WTO rules, that access will revert to the UK, just as UK access to EU resources will also close. The fishing industry in the UK will get an enormous shot in the arm if the UK phases out EU permits, and a similar effect will come into play regarding mineral rights, although not to the same extent. Naturally, the same effect is playing out in reverse, but the UK lands less than 90,000 tons of fish from EU waters, and the EU catch share in the rich waters around the British Isles constitutes roughly 70% of the total allowable catch quota for all parties. The other significant resource in question is petroleum, which for Europe lies primarily in the North Sea. Most of the fields lie in the British and Norwegian sectors. Access is more difficult to deny to oil platforms than fishing vessels, but EU platforms in British waters will likely have to pay more licensing fees to the UK and vice versa. This isn't a great bone of contention compared to UK fisheries because of the more balanced share of exploitation. Fisheries, however, are a huge matter of debate. Again, like the shipments of fresh fruits and vegetables, it's entirely possible for the UK to take a phased approach to reclaiming her fisheries. The share granted to the EU could be stepped down to allow a managed transition, and the UK could grant licenses to foreign vessels simply at a higher fee. This would support the recovery of the UK fishing industry without wiping out the foreign industries all in a day. In America, most people might not understand why this is such a bone of contention. After all, it's just fish, right? Except that the UK is actually engaged in several armed conflicts about fishing rights. The Cod Wars threaten to become general conflicts between Iceland and the UK over access to waters over which both claimed fishing rights. Fishing was once a primary industry in the UK and is still a significant cultural and economic matter for them. After all, they are an island nation. One might even say that some of the support for leave during the referendum had to do with the decline of the fishing industry in the face of greater EU exploitation. If we understand that, especially as the fisheries are one of many industries which have declined in the UK under EU oversight, then we understand the leave movement. On the other hand, if we bear in mind that those who have stability and financial freedom voted overwhelmingly to remain, 
then we understand the Remain movement. And if we truly understand just how precariously perched the European economy is, and what the EU stands to lose after Brexit, then we understand the EU position. To me, every group is practicing bravado, and none more successfully than the EU. I've already highlighted how the German and French bond yields are upside down in most denominations due to quantitative easing in a previous video. If you keep in mind that yields move inverse to the bond price and bond prices move inverse to the stock markets, and you will realize that the German and French markets are weak. Weak markets correlate to a weak economy, hence the quantitative easing. Now France and Germany are primary engines in the EU economy and they haven't recovered from the Great Recession. They need the UK to keep pushing forward their economic recovery, because any reduction in levels of trade between them and the UK could force them into a new recession. They've already lost a chunk of their exports to China because of the reduced GDP growth triggered by the US-China trade war. Now the UK has a golden opportunity to decouple their stagnant economic growth from the EU and start to do more business with the US. Yet their economists have pronounced doom and gloom regarding their economy and Brexit. Why? Because limits placed on it by Brussels have spiked their manufacturing sector growth and made them even more of a service-based economy through increased regulation, wealth transfers, and the redistribution of access to resources. Brexit will give the UK the chance to set their own laws, strike independent trade deals with the two biggest economies in the world, and finally start enjoying the economic boom which China and the U.S. have already experienced. But they have to get through Brexit first, and it looks like the House of Commons would rather argue with each other and keep stumbling into a truly chaotic end to their time in the EU. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. Check out my playlist and these channels I have subscribed for more great content. Like, share, and subscribe, and make sure that you ring the notification bell.